Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce our Warren uh, speaker, Jeremy Guest. Uh, Jeremy is an associate professor and the David C. Crawford faculty scholar um, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, Jeremy uh, is currently uh, working in the area of circular bioeconomies. And so one of the goals with his work that he'll talk about today is to achieve equitable, healthy, and prosperous communities while simultaneously enhancing the ecosystems that support them. So looking at both um, community support and, and um, reaching certain functional goals while also uh, decreasing environmental impact. Um, he is uh, currently the Associate Director for Research for the Institute of Sustainability, Energy, and Environment at UIUC, and also uh, the Sustainable Design Lead for the Center of Advanced Bioenergy and Bioproducts Innovation, which is a large, um, over $200 million center uh, funded by the Department of Energy at UIUC. Um, he's won a number of awards, uh, one of which was the NSF Career Award, He's also uh, the recipient of the Paul L. Bush Award for Innovation and in Applied Water Quality Research from uh, the Water Research uh, Foundation, which is a, a national organization. And he also was a 2021 James uh, J. Morgan Environmental Science and Technology Early Career, or received the Early Career Award for Creativity and Leadership in his field. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Jeremy. We're really happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks. thanks so much. Okay. One camera, we're good. Okay, all right. Uh, I'll try and make sure I stay on this section and don't drift too far that way. Just give me a nudge. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Paige, for the introduction and uh, for the invitation to be here. Uh, and it's been a wonderful like couple days, and I a lot of folks made time to to interact over the last couple days, which I'm grateful for. Um, it's been a wonderful visit. So I'm going to talk to you today about the circular bioeconomy and the space we work in. Um, but just to start off, I want to explain a little bit about why we do the sustainable design process, the type of work that we do. Um, and so this originates back to, let's see, my, my master's originally. So uh, this is me with raw sewage. So I was at uh, Virginia Tech and Professor Novak's here from Virginia Tech. So uh, it's nice to uh, see old faces. The, but my master's, we basically, we had this shed on the outside of Blacksburg or toward the edge of campus that we had to retrofit and then uh, pump up 200 liters of raw sewage every day and run through our reactors. And I was looking at biological nutrient removal, biological nitrogen and phosphorus removal. But I was really interested, and in uh, they're conventional processes. Um, we're mimicking full-scale plants in North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, I was really interested in resource recovery. So I had this idea that I was, I, I really wanted my work to focus on nutrient circularity, recover nitrogen and phosphorus from waste, sending it back to agriculture. Uh, every time I talked about it, and if I got a little space to explore it, do a little modeling, present it at a conference, got the same question every time. What does it cost? Like, how much does it cost? It's like, well, that's, that's not the point. Uh, you know, there's, there's intrinsic value and resource circularity. It's something important. We're not quantifying the, the detriment of this, our linear kind of take, use, waste uh, cycle. And so over time, I had to think about, all right, well, how do I chart pathways? How do I come up with ways to identify what is worth pursuing and uh, convincing others that it's uh, something we should invest in? So for my PhD, uh, I moved with my advisor to the University of Michigan. And uh, I wanted to work on more of a resource recovery technology. So I focused on microalgae for nutrient recovery from wastewater and as a feedstock for bioenergy and bioproducts. Uh, did some, a lot of experimentation, uh, process modeling, and I had some space uh, there to think about what sustainable, sustainability means in the context of wastewater. And so spent a lot of time thinking about what does sustainable resource recovery mean and applying it in some context to more conventional treatment systems, still not really having the space to apply it to resource recovery. Um, and then since moving to Illinois, uh, I've continued the algae work because algae are fun. Uh, and then we've gotten more kind of uh, rigorous and, and, and uh, developed a lot of methodologies to do lab scale work. And a lot of our recent work is focused on full scale implementation. So we have an industry partner that we've been working with for the last eight or so, eight or nine years. And uh, they now have uh, three full scale inst installations that run a system very similar to how we would design it. And they're all in Wisconsin. Uh, first one came online about uh, two or three years ago. And then two more came online in the fall. 
the largest one being 2.8 million gallons per day. So these are uh, quite large, like reasonably sized facilities, and we work very closely with them, do a lot of, uh, we have access to all the online data systems. We work with an on-site technician. Um, my students and our collaborator students go on site, and actually, so Dr. Hannah Molitor is in the room, so she was a postdoc who led that project for the first two years and now works in town, um, but where we do uh, really rigorous characterization and development of mechanistic process models to inform uh, design, optimization, and control. And then we've continued to develop out our sustainable design process because even for processes like this, we keep, you know, of course, get the question, what does it cost? What does it cost? And any other idea about resource recovery, what does it cost? And so we wanted a structured approach to be able to evaluate early stage technologies. Uh, because if you're gonna evaluate a new technology like algae for phosphorus removal, for tertiary treatment, building the very first facility is a lot more expensive than building the 50th. And so we don't want to do comparisons, or we don't think it's fair to do a comparison of the pilot, the, the fir very first pilot against something that's been run in industry for 30 or 40 years and had lots of opportunity for optimization. We can say how it is today, like a frontier plant, what would that cost and what would it look like? But we also want to look at the 50th plant, which is a, a process that's been in place and a methodology for renewable energy, for example. So NREL and others have been doing that for a long time. So as we think about you know, kind of where we've headed over time and, and the last uh, 12 plus years at Illinois, uh, I focus a lot on this, the circular bioeconomy. So we have kind of agricultural inputs, so nutrients at nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. We have agriculture that becomes, uh, goes to biorefineries. We could produce food, bioproducts, biofuels that go to the marketplace. And then uh, these fugitive resources, anything we're losing, uh, we want to recover. Anything that goes to the marketplace and, and this arrow, I'm mostly interested in bodily waste, so urine and fecal matter. Uh, the food goes through us, and the nitrogen and phosphorus come right back out uh, and, and to our wastewater treatment plants. And so we want to do resource recovery and try and get it back to ag. So my group, we, we work across this space through collaborations, but my group specifically, we focus on these two circles because this is largely process engineering. So we are designing facilities and processes that can recover resources. We are designing biorefineries that can take plants and turn them into biofuels, bioproducts, and food. Um, and so these are the two contexts in which we work. Um, the, we call these the human-derived resource systems, but thinking about nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium in particular, and then these plant-derived food, fuels, and products. And we're mostly focused on the biorefinery, but we interface with uh, agricultural feedstock production and then the marketplace through collaborations. So everything I'm going to show you today uh, these, this is my research group. Uh, it's done by them. Um, so uh, in particular, and we, we have a range of funding sources that, that, that I'll acknowledge, but a lot of our sanitation work is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and NSF, and some with uh, DO, Department of Energy. And then our biofuels, bioproducts, a lot of it is, as uh, Paige mentioned, the Center for Advanced Bioenergy and Bioproducts Innovation, which is a bioenergy research center, uh, DOE, and then Biomade, which is here in town in Minneapolis. Uh, it's a U.S. manufacturing institute. So I'm going to do this in three parts. We'll start off, and I want to talk about quantitative sustainable design. It's a structured methodology that we've developed and we use uh, to evaluate early stage technologies. I uh, want to go on and give a specific example of uh, treatment systems for uh, bodily waste and some work we've done uh, relevant to low income settings. And then uh, I also want to, I want to end by talking about you know, the development of tools that support this type of research for, for anybody. Um, so we've uh, made a lot of effort to develop open source tools such that others can pick up this work and, and leverage it for their own technologies or evaluations. I want to start off up here on uh, QSD. So the way we think about this is you have some technology, some system, whatever your widget is that you're developing. Uh, we have some baseline today, and we have some aspirations for this system or technology. Um, and so we try and break this down and we set goals. These can be broad qualitative statements. So in the sanitation space, we might say we want affordable sanitation. We want nutrient circularity, those are the big goals. But we need indicators to track progress toward those goals. And so uh, for a lot of our work, we can think about, we think about, for example, dollars per person per day for sanitation. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example, set this target of five cents per person per day uh, years, about 10 years ago. So they said, that's the target. That's what we want to hit. And we can think about things like percent of phosphorus that's in the wastewater recovered to agriculture. And let's say we're going to set a 50% target. 
And targets need to have a timeline. So we're gonna try and hit these numbers, for example, by 2030. But for any technology, we wanna come up with, we have these broad qualitative statements. We're gonna have specific indicators that we're gonna track. And then we're gonna set specific targets uh, to move our technology forward over time. And so what we do as we think about all the ways you could advance your technology, all the places you could deploy it, uh, we break down this, we try to find this problem space. So all the ways, for example, that you could uh, design your system, all the decisions you can make. So every choice you get to make about loading rates, material selection, uh, you know, configurations, what unit operations am I gonna use, whatever. Uh, these are your independent parameters that you can control. We then have the technological parameters. So this is everything you measure in the lab. So it'll be, all right, what are my actual kinetics? How long does my material last? What efficiencies am I observing? All that stuff, anything like that. And then lastly, we have contextual parameters. And these are the non-technological factors about where you deploy your technology. So my answer for those indicators like costs or environmental impacts, it's gonna depend on more than just the design choices you make and how well it performs. It depends on where you put it. So electricity prices will be different, fuel prices will be different, material prices will be different, wages will be different. We wanna consider all those factors. So we take these three things and, and, and we uh, kind of define all the ways you could design your system, all the, all the observations you could potentially see. So if, uh, for example, I have a can, uh, yield of a microorganism, so I'm gonna take a microorganism, it's gonna break down a, a product uh, or a feedstock and turn it into a product, my yield is somewhere between zero and 100% of, of what's, if I know the metabolism, what's theoretically possible. Sure, we'll go end to end. Uh, and then contextual parameters. We look at all the places you could deploy this technology, all the supporting characteristics, how it could be financed, the like, carbon intensity, the electricity grid, things like that. And what we do is we code uh, design algorithms, which uh, automate the full scale design of this based on these factors. So if I know at full scale how you design it and all the, the yields and kinetics that you would observe and where you're gonna put it, we can uh, simulate the full scale design. And then we have process algorithms that simulate its performance over its lifetime. So how is, what are all the mass and energy balances and what's this actually gonna look like uh, during operation? Once we have this, we layer on techno-economic analysis, so, uh, which is we essentially look at all the costs and, and revenue or any the taxes, everything, all financial metrics, and uh, we'll get to final indicators like dollars per kilogram of product, dollars per person per day, dollars per cubic meter treated, whatever the indicator is for your system. We use life cycle assessment, which helps us understand the broader environmental implications of a technology, and it lets us get to things like life cycle greenhouse gas emissions, which will normalize to CO2 equivalents, so kilogram CO2 equivalents per kilogram, uh, kilogram CO2 equivalents per person per year, whatever. And you can do additional analyses to base, to base on your specific system. So in some of our work, for example, in informal settlements in uh, East Africa, we'll look at uh, quantitative microbial risk assessment. So we'll look at the likelihood of exposure to pathogens and, and children getting infected. Uh, so you can layer on other analytical tools based on your domain and what's particularly relevant to you. Now, as I've said multiple times, uh, early stage kind of technology development, but regardless of its early stage or not, we're making a lot of assumptions here and that can make it's very uncomfortable, right? It's, it's very difficult to go from like a flask scale and suggest that you know how this thing is gonna perform at full scale. And that's why we vary these parameters a lot, but we also do uncertainty analysis and sensitivity analysis. And for the uncertainty analysis, we can make things highly uncertain. We start by having very large uncertainty around performance assumptions, uh, use assumptions, loading rates, whatever, and we'll do global sensitivity analyses. And the point here is, we wanna start and be conservative in our estimates that we really don't know what things are gonna look like at full scale. And once we do our sensitivity analysis, although we made 200 assumptions, it's gonna boil down to maybe five that matter a lot and 195 that don't matter so much. And so then we can focus more on those five. Uh, we can do additional experiments, look for additional data, build a more mechanistic model, whatever is required to continue to move the analysis forward. So we've applied this in a number of ways. Uh, I just wanna maybe give some examples from, of, of the breadth of, of the type of work we've done. So I had mentioned algae, so we've done a lot of work on microalgae. 
that um, we started at bench scale and we've been scaling up. And so this is actually from uh, Hannah's paper that's in, in revision. Um, but, and this is the uh, clear as process, our, our industry partner. And so algae comes in and we have a dark mix tank. It goes on to photobioreactors and then membranes. Um, and this process is performing really well. Uh, so we've gone from a lot of our bench scale experiments, which is what we did in my first nine or 10 years at, at Illinois. And we've been moving to the field and, and full scale. And so algae for phosphorus recovery and then use of algae for biofuels and bioproducts has is, is always been of interest to us. Um, we've also worked on in particular anaerobic membrane bioreactors. So this is a technology in wastewater treatment uh, to convert organic material into uh, methane in particular. And so there are lots of ways you can design this process. And so uh, this was uh, one study, for example, so the, the bolded one is whatever the figure's from, um, that we looked at all the ways you could design an anaerobic membrane bioreactor to try and prioritize which configurations might make the most sense. Um, and in this work too, we highlighted that of the 150 discrete combinations you can come up with, there's a cluster that has the greatest potential to reduce costs and energy consumption and life cycle environmental impacts. And there are a couple other clusters that, that just will not compete uh, with that first cluster. Um, and you can look to industry and see that one company's got the patent on one of those clusters and another company's got the patent on a cluster that doesn't look so good. Um, and so if you're thinking about continuing to do research and move a technology forward, you wanna focus on the ones that have the greatest potential to drive down costs and impact. Uh, working with uh, Paige and Bill and Natasha who's in the room, um, we've been looking at the, this METAB system that they've developed. And so uh, thinking about then encapsulated microbes and hydrogen production and methane production and separating that. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I'm like in the house that, that, that built it. Um, and then uh, we do a lot on hydrothermal based processes. So this is like hydrothermal liquefaction and others. Essentially, we take any kind of organic waste, you put it in a pressurized vessel and you get your, your mimicking the process that happened underground to produce crude oil. And so you produce bio oil in, a, in less than an hour uh, from organic matter. And so we've done that type of work um, with, with a collaborator, uh, Tim Strathman at Colorado School of Mines, where we build the models, uh, we build the, the, do the techno-economic analysis lifecycle assessment, and Tim's group does the experimental work. And our most recent NSF is actually on using this process to break down PFAS as well. And then our work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has centered on something called non-sewered sanitation. So non-sewered sanitation are technologies that don't require underground sewers. So here we you know, flush the toilet, it goes in a pipe underground and it makes its way to a treatment plant. Uh, so a lot of the places we work, especially in uh, East and West Africa, South Africa, India, China, uh, there are many, uh, especially rural locations, but also informal settlements or areas of the city that don't have infrastructure that the Gates Foundation is looking to deploy these non sewered technologies that can handle an individual household, about 100 to 300 people or 10,000 to 12,000 people. Uh, and treat their wastes nearby or on site. And so we work with the teams that develop these individual technologies. We build models of their processes and help them prioritize research and development. And then we work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to inform like each year their annual strategy to how they're gonna invest to continue to develop and then deploy these technologies. And then lastly, what we've moved into most recently on, on the biofuels and bioproducts. So we've been working in this space for, for the last uh, seven or eight years. And uh, as part of CABI, we have two other thrusts. I'm in the sustainability thrust. The other two are feedstock production and conversion. And so these are, uh, there are 60 plus researchers involved in CABI. Um, and so we work with the feedstock team and there's a lot of researchers who are developing novel feedstocks. So they take uh, CABI's mostly perennial grasses, things like miscanthus, or sugarcane. And what they do is they modify the sugarcane, for example, to instead of accumulating sugar, to accumulate triacylglycerol, which is a uh, tag, it's an oil. Uh, and so then in, when you squeeze the sugar cane, instead of sugar coming out, oil comes out. And so you have oil that you can then send into a process for biodiesel or renewable diesel. So we work with folks who are uh, engineering those plants to help them set targets for, if you're accumulating oil, you might have a reduction in like yield, how much biomass you grow uh, in, in, in per hectare. And so we help them understand what trade-off is acceptable that will still be financially viable and have an environmental benefit. And then we collaborate a lot with, with folks in conversions, mostly chemical engineers, ag and bioengineers, uh, but uh, who do synthetic biology, catalysis and separations, where they've got an idea for a new microorganism that they're gonna change its metabolic pathways. 
Uh, they have an idea for a new catalyst. They have an idea for a new separation process. And we can help evaluate whether or not it has the potential to outcompete the existing technologies and what's most important for them to prioritize moving forward in their research and development. Um, and across all these projects, we tend to land on a handful of questions that, that folks have or that we have about the technologies. Um, first one is what, basically how much will it cost, right? I said that in the beginning, or what's the carbon intensity? And so here we're you know, calling this just characterizing sustainability indicators. So we get values like if cost, carbon intensity, anything else, we'll get a baseline, which is maybe what, what they saw in the lab. And if we assume that that scales up exactly like the lab, uh, and then we can put uncertainty around it. And so we can yield those types of numbers and say, okay, this is going to cost between you know, $2 and $3 per kilogram when you make this bioproduct. Um, so that's one. Second is, what are the sustainability drivers? So what are the dominant sources of costs and impacts? So we can look at costs and carbon intensity and anything else and, and break it down across all the contributors to costs, all the contributors to carbon intensity, and help them identify what are those uh, key hotspots, as we call a hotspot analysis. One of my favorites, though, is setting targets. And so here's one that uh, we don't necessarily even need to know how the technology is going to perform. We, need to, we can tell the researchers how it needs to perform uh, for it to be viable. And so, for example, if we're looking at cost or some indicator here, this is some input like what CODA removal am I going to achieve? What yield am I going to achieve? What kinetics will I achieve at scale? We analyze it across the entire range of what's reasonably possible. And then we can, if we have a target for cost, for example, we could tell you what where you need to be such that you start to have the potential to compete or be financially viable. We could say, oh, your you know, COD removal needs to be at least 80%. Uh, do we think that's possible? And if the answer is yes, like, okay, well, we've seen 80% or 90% from similar processes. Okay, let's go after it. And you do the experimentation. Uh, if it comes back and it says the only way that you'll hit your cost target is if you're at over 100% COD removal. That's you know, not going to happen. Uh, so we have to look at the system and see if there's something holding us back or if there's some other context in which we could deploy it that it would uh, be viable. And so the intent here, too, is not necessarily to eliminate a technology or discount a technology right off the bat. It's for us to focus our efforts around the most effective way to make it viable or to be able to make a case, have a value proposition for the technology. We focus on understanding sensitivity. So we'll do these global sensitivity analyses and all these assumptions that we make. Um, we want to understand what are the key drivers. And lastly, uh, well, maybe my favorite. I said targets was my favorite. This might be my favorite. So uh, exploring research development and deployment pathways. So what's the most effective path forward for our technology? And I'm going to come back to like this Rubik's Cube type image. Um, I don't uh, know if it communicates it perfectly, but I really like it. So we'll talk more about it. Um, but the idea is that we can push and pull these models to explore what are the combinations of decision variables, technological parameters, contextual parameters that lead to this technology winning or being the best choice. And do those conditions exist? Can we prioritize investing in them? All right. So across this space, uh, in all these, we do this quantitative sustainable design process. This part of our research portfolio for my research group, like uh, we're here, but we also, for wastewater technologies, in particular algae, we do all three of these. We do the experimentation, modeling, and sustainable design. For a lot of water wastewater technologies, we'll do the modeling and sustainable design. And then for like an example I'll show you later, later on synthetic biology, others do the modeling. They'll do metabolic flux analysis and other uh, components. And we focus more on this sustainable design piece. Um, but depends on the collaboration. But we'll do all three of these for algae and resource recovery from wastewater. And we'll focus more on like the modeling and sustainable design in a lot of our collaborations. So I want to go through and give a specific example of uh, some work we've done with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on non sewered sanitation. Um, and then we'll end by talking about these, uh, how we've standardized this process. So this is called the New Generator. New Generator was developed at the University of South Florida. The Gates Foundation originally had this reinvent the toilet challenge where they put up and uh, basically invited craziest ideas to achieve five cents per person per day sanitation and with no sewers. And essentially, they're supposed to have no connection to the electricity grid or anything else. And so teams submitted ideas. They picked about a dozen across the world and gave them some seed funding to develop them out. One was a new generator. So the new generator uh, essentially uses anaerobic membrane bioreactors, um, ion exchange, electrochlorination, 
It often relies on grid electricity, but they, can, they have the capacity to set up photovoltaics um, and batteries to operate it as well. And so we work with the teams. Uh, we like to collaborate with people. So um, we work with the teams to get access to a significant amount of data. They had these 534 day field trial in South Africa uh, that they had run the system. Um, we build, we, we get all of their operational data, their maintenance data, um, what challenges did they run into, uh, what clogged it when, and, and you know, uh, how did they, did they make any changes to avoid that happening again? And then we come up with descriptions or models of all these different unit operations, the anaerobic membrane bioreactor, they call this the nutrient capture system, electrochlorination. Um, and we track, we do our models to build mass and energy balances and uh, characterize all the costs. We then uh, simulate production of this unit, or of, of this system, not as the frontier, you know, first version, but we look at, well, what if for the Gates Foundation, they're looking at building 100,000 of these units or a million of these units. And so what does it cost when we build 100,000 of them? Because that drives, there's a learning curve in manufacturing that drives down costs dramatically. Uh, and we expect it to last you know, 25 years, but that'll be uncertain. And we're gonna simulate, run this, these simulations 10,000 times under uncertainty uh, with 100 users per day. And so this is an example of like, okay, what are the costs? What are, what's the carbon intensity? It's an example of what comes out. So these are uh, kernel density plots. The, the darker area is more points, more simulations were there. Uh, and if it helps, there are box some whiskers above and below. So we have the photovoltaic was right here. So it costs just a little bit more usually, but less greenhouse gas emissions. Or, uh, and then here's our grid tied energy, uh, slightly higher greenhouse gas emissions, slightly less cost in this context where we were evaluating its deployment. So we can get a sense for where it's you know, coming in. So we're in the neighborhood of like 14 cents per person per day. That's not bad. Uh, we're doing okay. We're, we're trying to get down to five, but five was ambitious. So, uh, and then we can compare it to the existing pit latrines, transport and anaerobic digestion in that community uh, where they were testing. So pit latrines, the cost is, is quite a bit lower, um, but they have more methane emissions, fugitive methane emissions in particular that puts them up here. So slightly higher greenhouse gas emissions, but definitely costing less so far. Like, okay, well, how can we drive down costs? And so the first thing the team says is, oh, we can increase the number of users. Cool, what would that do? So here's number of users on the x-axis. This is cost on the y, and I'll get to the right graph in a second. This is dollars per capita per day. So here was our initial estimate. We were at about 14 cents uh, per person per day. And then the, in the brackets is fifth and 95th percentiles. Uh, and then, so if we were to double the number of users, that'd bring us down to 11.2 cents per person per day for uh, the grid tide. And if we went to 300, we're down at 10 cents. So it's not that we're having it by going from 100 to 200. It's not that we're cutting it to one third the cost as we go from 100 to 300, because a lot of the operational consumption is tied to the loading rate. So the amount of waste that comes in all cost incurs energy consumption and, and waste. Ah, uh, so yes, excellent question. So 300 people use one toilet. So this is what they call a back-end technology, which means that there are toilets set up that then the waste flows directly into this behind it. Yeah. And so what they, what we, the reason this plateaus, or a key reason, one is operational demand. The other one is that the front end, the toilet itself, becomes dominating the cost. So for every, I think it's 20 people, we add a toilet. So that's why you can't get lower. Um, and so then we have greenhouse gas emissions. And this plateau is basically right away, we see a minimal benefit. Again, it's because uh, the loading rate, the key driver of greenhouse gas emissions is tied to the number of people who are using it, the amount of waste that it's treating. So increasing users doesn't really help. Um, so we can do things like that. And now we wanna know though, and, and so we work with the team to say, okay, yes, there's some incremental benefits, absolutely, to increasing loading, but it's not gonna get you all the way to five cents. Uh, so, uh, then as we take a step back and the team continues to advance their technology and make changes, we worked with a bunch of teams. So we've done uh, Omni processors. This is the larger unit that uh, is, does pyrolysis on fecal sludge and then has lagoons to handle the wet waste. Um, this is called the reclaimer system from Duke. Uh, so they use uh, ultrafiltration, granular activated carbon ion exchange, electrochemical disinfection. So we build models of all these as well. And we wanna take a step back and, and try and think about which technologies might make the most sense. So now we worked with each of these teams and helped give them targets and things they can focus on. But now we wanna think about 
we have a portfolio of technologies, where might we deploy them? Uh, how can we be most effective? So again, we build models of, of the full uh, processes, all the unit operations, and uh, we think about deployment in different contexts. And so we've done this type of work in very specific contexts too. So in Kampala, Uganda, we've uh, been on site with and deployed a thousand surveys with uh, a bunch of my students, 10 students from Macarera, collaborators from Macarera University, uh, NGO partners, local uh, uh, government representatives and community representatives, uh, working with the Kampala Capital City Authority. Um, we've had hired Macarera students to go out to hardware stores and, and, and construction suppliers and get unit costs of all different materials so we could make it hyper-specific and, and hyper-local. Um, but now we want to take a step back and think about broadly, what are the salient features of a location that we need to know to be able to have a discussion about which technologies make the most sense and what are the key cost drivers. So we looked up, you know, we look at data that's, that's available. This is at a national level, um, but things like different wages, energy costs, uh, animal and veg vegetable protein intake, caloric intake, things like that, that, that are going to influence our models. And so for each of these technologies, the reclaimer, the new generator, the omniprocessor, we're going to run simulations under uncertainty in each of those, these 77 countries. So we have daily costs, again, on the x-axis, greenhouse gas emissions on the y. And so one set of simulations, I'm not going to show uncertainty yet, is, is just going to be a point. So if I take the data, the values from one country, it's, a technology is going to land in one spot. And then if I run it in 77 countries, each of these is one of those simulations. And then if I push and pull the models and say, we're actually uncertain about a lot of these assumptions, then it's going to land somewhere in this box. So across all these scenarios, as we push and pull the models, we make uh, a, a, we embed uncertainty in all of our assumptions. The reclaimer will land somewhere in this. This is its problem space. This is where it lands. And if I do the same thing for the new generator or for the biogenic refinery, we can see where they land. So the new generator will land somewhere in here. The reclaimer will land somewhere in here. The biogenic refinery will land somewhere in here. And we could do the same thing. These are, these are grid tied and the biogenic refinery using pit latrines. They had an alternate scenario that, that they were going to use photovoltaics. And this one was going to install urine diverting dry toilets, which is a more expensive toilet. Uh, and we could see where they land. And so we'll see there's some you know, overlap, for, uh, for example, in cost that there may be scenarios that the new generator is more expensive, but there are a lot of scenarios that it's less expensive than the reclaimer. Omniprocessor does really well a lot of times. It's down here. And so we want to think about you know, what that means and what are the key features driving the spread across these results. And so if we look at Spearman's rank order correlation coefficients, we can look across all the countries for which we have data. And we'll look at uh, basically the rank order of the caloric intake, for example, and all the other uh, location-specific data, and greenhouse gas emissions, or costs. And we're going to look at uh, these rank order correlation coefficients and plot them on this, where um, we have kind of costs and greenhouse gas emissions and our different assumptions or, or location-specific data uh, across the biogenic refinery, new gen, and reclaimer. And so a big circle means high correlation, that, that this value, the grid electricity price, was a key driver for this particular design. Uh, a small one means this one, this uh, vegetable protein intake was a small driver uh, for this particular, for cost for this design, for this system. And so this is what we get. I don't actually want you to focus on those circles. I'm going to keep the ones that are big. And, and so what this means is, okay, if we're thinking about grid tied scenarios, local electricity price and carbon intensity electricity grid are some of the key drivers. If across all scenarios, labor wages and price level ratios, which influences construction costs, are really important. Uh, pit latrine and solar scenarios, caloric intake matters a lot. And for the biogenic refinery, uh, animal, in, animal protein intake and household size matters a lot. It affects collection schedules and things like that. So, but it, what it does is, what this does for us, is that when we're talking to uh, a utility in Johannesburg or Durban or Accra, uh, means we're not asking, we're not sending a laundry list of 100 pieces of information that we need to kind of to evaluate technologies or get some kind of locality specific cost estimate. We need like eight things, six, eight things. And so that makes it a lot easier for us to enter into a discussion with the utility and help some early stage decision making um, as they move forward. And also for our own data collection, it lets us focus our efforts around the things that are most important, that are most uh, going to govern our uncertainty and our results. Um, 
And then when we have all this, when we've done this for um, both our uh, individual technologies, but now our portfolio of technologies, we get to go back to my Rubik's Cube. Uh, so this is, we're calling this the problem space, right? So I introduced the problem space earlier as this n-dimensional space where it's every combination of your decision variables, that, the choices that you can make, every combination of, of assumptions you can make about technological parameters, your efficiencies and yields and so on, every assumption you can make about the location-specific characteristics of deployment. So local electricity prices, uh, diet, and so on. So we have this entire space. What we're interested in understanding is where in this entire space does, for example, like technology A have the lowest costs and greenhouse gas emissions, if these are our two sustainability indicators we're focused on. What are the features of these cells that lead to this one winning on, on, on all fronts? For another technology we're considering, what are the features of these cells that lead to it having the lowest cost and lowest greenhouse gas emissions? What are the features that lead to trade-offs? So in these, where maybe it's perhaps it's the lowest cost but higher greenhouse gas emissions. So we're looking to understand the salient features of one of these grid cells, essentially, uh, that, that dictate whether technology A is a clear winner, technology B is a clear winner, so that when we're thinking about deployment of technologies, we have a better framework to make recommendations about how to move forward and narrow the landscape of designs that we could consider, configurations we can consider. So what it looks like for these three, um, just as an illustration, uh, we might think about, okay, the omniprocessor, the omniprocessor, the one that can handle 10 to 12,000 people, it was lower cost, lower greenhouse gas emissions. So the main challenge with it are these contextual constraints. It only works if you've got a high enough population density such that people can use hand carts and then trucks to, to get it to the facility. Um, it only works if uh, you've got pit latrines or urine diverting dry toilets. Um, it, and yeah, so we basically, if those constraints are met, if, it's, if we're considering a location, an informal settlement or city where those general conditions are met, omniprocessor wins, like from these three, across these three technologies, lowest cost, lowest greenhouse gas emissions. Now, if we're in a separate, like the po a separate area, the population is a little more spread out, let's say they have flush toilets, um, things like that, then uh, we can look at where the new generator wins and where the reclaimer wins. And so across these locations, the new generator tends to have lowest cost and lowest emissions when these general features are met. So the labor wages are low. So this is a more labor, operationally labor intensive process. Uh, but, and when electricity prices are high and the price level ratio is low, solar was the better choice and vice versa. The grid was a better choice. And these conditions existed in like 66 of the 77 scenarios that we looked at. Uh, alternatively, the reclaimer, when labor wages are really high, it passes the new gen and, and becomes the better alternative in terms of cost, not greenhouse gas emissions, but cost. And so you have a trade-off. And we can look at the features of those locations that would lead you to choose solar or lead you to choose grid tied. Um, and we can continue the discussion with the foundation to understand, okay, specific, what are the specific locations where the new gen is gonna make the most sense? And we can dive deeper into a detailed design and evaluation of, of the uh, site-specific evaluation. Um, so this idea of identifying like salient features is something we're really interested in because these systems are really complex. It's not just uh, a technology, it's not just ultra filtration, it's not just membrane bioreactors. These are interconnected systems that we interact with social systems. Um, and so we have to understand not just you know, the on-site storage and the fecal sludge collection, but the user experience, what it means for equity and well-being. Uh, we got to think about local agriculture, local environmental conditions and susceptibility, any policies. Kampala, for example, a uh, capital city authority has a policy that any new toilets have to be flushing. Omniprocessors out, can't be used uh, with current policies. So this is, we have to consider all these factors um, when we're thinking through uh, deployment strategies of technologies. And ways we've been doing this, so we've been building this um, analytical framework that we're layering together. But one, we think about current and projected resource access. And so um, if we're thinking about like nitrogen recovery versus or phosphorus recovery, it matters how much access they have to nitrogen fertilizers right, and phosphorus fertilizers right now. So in the US, we couldn't offset 2% of our nitrogen use in agriculture if we recovered all of the, uh, the waste, uh, the nitrogen in our uh, bodily waste in the United States, not, not 2%. Uh, but there are countries where you could triple access to nitrogen fertilizer if you did it. Um, 
we think about co-location of supply of nutrients, that's where we are, uh, and then demand for crops, and that's crop specific. Um, we thought about aligning soil context and uh, recovery product chemistry. So soil context is meant to capture a number of factors, including, uh, for example, the, the pH of the soil, uh, its cation exchange capacity. Um, and so it, we don't want to add a uh, highly like, caustic product to a, a caustic soil. It could inhibit uh, yields even more. But we might intentionally want to add a more acidic product to a caustic soil if it means it could um, have benefits for the soil. Uh, we think about e connecting it with ecosystem services and how we value those. And then we think about making sanitation an investment. So instead of sanitation being aid driven, which historically it has, meaning governments or uh, philanthropic organizations have to just donate money to build pit latrines and then nobody pays to maintain them. Um, we instead think about, think about it as, as we recover the nutrients, as we recover energy, can, they, can that pay for itself? Can that pay for the operation and maintenance of the systems? Can that pay for even construction of new systems? Um, so as we think about all those things, uh, I, I want to transition to talk about how we enable these analyses and enable us to continue to build off them. So we had all these projects, um, which I've really enjoyed. Uh, one thing early on my students did not enjoy is when a new student starts and uh, we're like, oh, we want to build on John's work or whoever's work, Diana's work, and uh, say, oh, take a look at their code. It's like, that is an awful experience. If you've ever picked up someone else's code, and had to like use it. You have no idea why they made the choices they made, why it's structured the way it's structured, what this means. It, is, it was just very frustrating for them. And so, okay, we gotta do something about this. We wanna be able to build on our work and we want others to build on our work. We don't just want it to sit on a shelf and collect dust. So um, we were fortunate to get uh, be part of CABI, the Bioenergy Research Center, which gave us sustained funding for five years and let us set kind of an ambitious target to develop an open source software package that enabled biorefinery design, simulation, technical economic analysis, life cycle assessment. And then over time, we repeated that process for uh, wastewater and sanitation because it's and resource recovery because it's what we love to do. So I want to introduce these a little bit um, as, as uh, something we've been working on and continuing to build out. So uh, everything's on GitHub. We have two software packages. One is called BioSteam uh, and one is called uh, uh, QSD SAN in particular. So that's in the quantitative sustainable design group. Everything's open source. Uh, we have really robust documentation. This is all on read the docs. And we've got uh, webinars and my, the, the students in the group uh, and Yalin, Dr. Yalin Lee, who's now assistant professor at Rutgers, uh, led a lot of this work, but they develop uh, like onboarding materials, uh, presentations. Uh, there's in, in BioSteam and QSD SAN, you can go step by step and it like, it eases you in. It says, okay, this is how you install a program, like, you know, and, and install this software. This is, this is where you get Anaconda or something if you want to run Python. Um, and so click here, and then it'll take you through, and okay, this is how you create a unit. This is how you create a stream, and it'll have screenshots of all the steps through the process, um, and it'll guide you through end-to-end um, -to, -end to be able to start like, running uh, the software. And it is Python though, right? So you see this, but we do have, we're able to leverage uh, some packages that automate, for example, the, the generation of process flow diagrams and you can track things and make sure they make sense and everything's connected the way that it should be. Um, and we've been over time continuing to develop this out um, such that we add capabilities that allow us to answer the types of questions that we have and answer them in a more and more robust way. So we have uh, packages that automate you know, the, the uh, sizing, costing, the mass and energy balances. We have our own thermodynamic engine. We've been developing out automation tools. This is a major roadblock in the evaluation of uh, bio products and biofuels is the, is the design of the downstream separation processes. And so um, we've developed a package autosynthesis to automate that pro part of that process. It's gonna take time to continue to develop it out. Um, we have techno-economic analysis, life cycle assessment, and then we have a specific repository that every configuration we've ever published is freely available online. So any paper we've published, you can go download it within minutes. You can re uh, reproduce our results and change any parameter you want and run it for yourself or insert a new unit operation or change something about the configuration. Uh, we want people to build on the work. Um, and so to give an example of like the types of, like the rhythm of, of, of our types of projects, this is one from uh, Biomaid and CABI, but uh, this is with collaborators, all chemical engineers, so Hui Men Zhao at, at 
Illinois, Josh Rabinowitz at Princeton, and Vijay Singh in Ag and Bioengineering at um, uh, Illinois. And so uh, they have an idea to take Isochenchia orientalis and in particular make it peat more acid tolerant and produce more succinic acid. So they do the uh, strain de design, metabolic flux analysis, they construct the strain, they do it at flask scale and then up to a couple liters. Then they hand off the bug, the microorganism to Vijay Singh, who runs our integrated bioprocessing research lab. And he scales it up to 50 liters or 300 liters to get larger scale data. And then while we work with them and iterate, we develop the full biorefinery design uh, and code it into BioSteam. Um, and the nice thing about our, the software we use is it uses object-oriented programming, which means that if we have existing units, like multi-effect evaporators, we've already coded them. You just pick it up and put it in. You just call the multi-effect evaporator. But if you need a new technology, you need to code that yourself. But for many of our processes, we're just we're picking up units that have already been coded. Um, and assembling them in a way that makes sense. And then when we do this, we iterate with the bioprocessing lab and we say, oh, we wanna do crystallization. We just wanna make sure that we have uh, the right expectation for recovery. So they test it um, with, with the broth that they get back out of this process. And then where we can get is this characterization of, of indicators. So this is minimum product selling price. This is cost. And here's from their, based on their lab yields and, and concentrations and productivity rates. Uh, another lab experiment, the pilot experiment, this is where they land, depending on the assumptions you make. Here's the typical market price range. And if you're the historically, the bio-based price range that's reported is a, is a broader set, but we're near the bottom and we're below the typical market price. Um, we can do the same. We can break down and say, what are the key drivers? So what's driving installed equipment costs or cooling duty or heating or operating costs? We do the same thing for carbon intensity. So here's global warming potential, 100 year time horizon. And we can compare it to fossil-based succinic acid or bio-based succinic acid that's in the literature. And we're on par with a lot of the bio-based, definitely below the uh, fossil-based. And again, see what's driving greenhouse gas emissions. And then our collaborators' favorite plots are these. Um, and so what we do here is they observe like one yield, which is the amount of product they achieve per feedstock, gram of feedstock. And then titer is the maximum concentration of the product that they can get, in this case, succinic acid. And so they generally think they want to be up and to the right. That makes sense. Um, like lots of product but and uh, really high concentration. But what we're able to do is not just run the one simulation, the one result, which is over here, uh, that they gave us. We can say, oh, what would happen if you improved yield? What would happen if you improved titer? What would happen if it's worse? And we can characterize minimum product selling price. We can characterize carbon intensity. And those things may be in tension with each other, meaning to get better in cost, we're actually going to drive up carbon intensity a little bit. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that, but I'm not going to go into detail. Um, in this moment, I'm behind. <laughs> and so, uh, but it helps them chart pathways. And so from this, because price was the key driver, uh, the next thing they did, they needed higher yield. So they went back. And the strain engineering turned off byproduct pathways, so more of the carbon went to succinic acid, developed the strain again, ran it again, scaled up again, and now we have new data within a couple months. Uh, and so we're going to keep pushing this up and to the right. Um, so this is like the, kind of the general rhythm of our work, but we hopefully you have some understanding of, of the quantitative sustain, sustainable design work we do um, that we mean, like we have a structure to process to evaluate early stage technologies. We're doing this in particular, like in, in sanitation and resource recovery, but also in biofuels and bioproducts, and that we see a lot of value. And I enjoy like, part of my group's impact being the development of these open source tools such that hopefully others can build off the work but do their own thing. And we don't have to be part of the process at all. Um, so to support an ecosystem of sustainable design around these technologies. Um, and then the last two, I'm going to have two more slides, just or maybe it's three with animation, uh, about kind of where we're headed and how we're pulling these pieces together. Um, so the first, in the, in the resource recovery space, as we think about this complex system, what, where we're headed, what we're continuing to do is continue to develop out a portfolio of, of resource recovery and non sewer sanitation technologies um, and, and conventional technologies against which to benchmark. Uh, we're continuing to develop out our understanding of location-specific conditions so that we can define the opportunity space. So what are the key features of a location and characteristics of a design that lead it to it being a great choice and having a value for a community? And then we send back that prioritization research, development, and deployment 
uh, for technology development, but also technology deployment. And a lot of our Gates Foundation work right now is centered around specific cities and evaluating deployment strategies for non-sewer sanitation. In the biofuels bioproduct space, uh, we will continue to prioritize research, development, and deployment of these types of technologies. Um, so we are mostly here. Uh, historically, we have been developing out models, logistics models, to understand feedstock production, harvesting, and transport. Um, we work with collaborators who do ecosystem scale models and economic scale models, uh, economy scale models. Um, but where we're like also headed, so we, we intend to continue to develop this portfolio uh, of models, but in complementary domains. So not just biofuels and bioproducts, but there are a lot of systems, engineered technologies that we would be excited to also have an impact in that space and develop out tools to support research ecosystems in that space. So anything that supports generally like a circular economy, not even just a circular bioeconomy, um, if we can you know, tailor our tools and, and tailor our analyses and hopefully generate like insight about the salient features that are governing technology moving forward or having the greatest impact in a domain, that fits within our general research theme of understanding these dynamic interactions between nature and society and how do we move them on more sustainable trajectories. That's not just biofuels and bioproducts. That's not just sanitation and resource recovery. It's any, it's any societal functioning. So that's where I'll end. Um, if people are interested, like if you want to, if you do sanitation, resource recovery, water technologies, you want to see QSD SAN, anybody doing uh, like chemical development or bioproducts, biofuels, that's uh, links to the software. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for an excellent talk. It was really interesting. I have a couple questions you um, had alluded to what I'm getting at, but we have a course here called Design for Life, Water Distribution Systems in Tanzania. And in that, on the ground, um, we've worked with the community to introduce water distribution systems. And two things that we found is maintenance is a huge issue because you can install a system, but the local people who can maintain it, if things break, they go back to the original way. With the type of system that you put in, it's important for the community to know in terms of, you know, what culturally is acceptable. And you might put things like by a school or a dispensary that might kind of control this the system. So it sounded like you talked about cultural things and that, but I didn't see it incorporated in your model. And how do you get at that community input that really um, drives the success of these systems? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a it's a great question. So the so in my um, uh, the PhD where we started, we, we brought this interdisciplinary team together and <laughs> we were hoping for like a definition of sustainable wastewater treatment. And everybody came to the table confident in, that they had a definition, but they were all very disparate. Uh, and so part of what we focused on in that early work was planning and design processes to engage stakeholders to define a path forward, criteria for success, what are the constraints, um, what are the key features of the system? So how that's evolved over time is uh, we do like, so in particular, a lot of our work has been in Kampala and Nairobi. Uh, and then we've done some work in Northern Ghana and more of an agricultural focus in Tamale. Um, and now we're working in Johannesburg and Durban, South Africa and, and a few other places. But in, in Boise is an informal settlement in Kampala, for example. So in that context, um, we, the, the typical way that we work is we want to make tools or do analyses that generate insight for decision makers. We are, we always, we have a particular recipe that we look for in those contexts that is there's an NGO that's owned and run by locals, been there for 15 plus years, and that they are excited about this type of information. And then we want to be able to provide that information and they are the ones out front. It is never, uh, we're just there to support. Um, and so in those contexts, it, it requires a lot of discussion and on the ground understanding to say, all right, what are the key constraints? What technologies or systems could work? What is the value proposition? So what will people actually appreciate about this? And uh, through that type of work uh, and in engaging with, with community members and local leaders, that, that's one of the reasons we've really shifted toward resource recovery or, well, I already wanted to do resource recovery, but I found something, I found an audience where resource recovery works really well. And that's because when we typically deploy sanitation, um, there's a mentality that latrines work. Um, if you install a latrine, if you come back within one year, there's a 50, greater than 50% chance it was either never used or it's done, it's, it's closed down uh, for it's, it's no longer functioning. Um, so greater than 
my book, that doesn't work, right? Uh, so one of the uh, things we focused on was what is the value proposition that we can offer with a, a sanitation technology? And you can't offer, you can't guarantee better health outcomes. You can't guarantee it, you know, it's a better user experience because actually they stink, they, they, they can smell terrible. Um, you can have flies and spiders and kids are scared to go in there. Kids under three still won't use them. There's a lot of those, like what we assume to be benefits of sanitation aren't actually observed benefits. Uh, and so that's where we landed on resource recovery in particular, because if you can recover nutrients that have a financial, like an economic value, if you can recover energy that has an economic value, somebody can have you know, money in their hand at the end of the day. Um, and so by doing that, we can create an economic ecosystem, like a little ecosystem of uh, people who are paid well to handle and gather waste. They can have health insurance um, and they you know, transport the waste. Uh, there's good resource recovery, there, the, there's a business out of it, so it garners investment, it's not just aid driven, and there's a financial incentive for, to keep that system running. Um, so that's what led us in that direction. There's a separate set of questions I didn't address at all um, about like the kind of the ethical issues related to um, taking value from someone else's waste and investing and then expecting that return. Like you don't even own your waste anymore. That's like, I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, we, we've touched on it in like one paper, but we have not, uh, and we wrote like one NSF, you know, uh, uh, proposal about it. And then all my social science collaborators moved away um, from Illinois. So um, we did not get to continue that work, but uh, I think it's, it's a really important point and it's, it requires on the ground understanding. And that's too, that we are, we don't approach with a solution uh, in those contexts. We engage with the people who have been on the ground for an extended period of time. And we say, how can we help you make better decisions? Uh, better informed decisions, help you make a case for what you think would be most important. And so for some of this work in Boise in particular, we were able to show like the existing management of waste, something that the NGO was really excited about, and then something that like donors kept talking about, container-based sanitation. We showed that the one that the NGO was focused on actually drives down costs, carbon intensity, and has the greatest benefit. And they can use that information to then sell it to the Compiled Capital City Authority and donors. Oh, very nice talk. I have a question regarding your simulation. You show your uncertainty in the output. Do you know how much uncertainty is coming from input data and how much from the model itself? If I choose a model differently, how the uncertainty will change? Yeah, that's uh, an important one too. So we, we do, we can, uh, the way the model structured uh, or the whole framework is structured is that we can put uncertainty around all of our input parameters and, and do our uncertainty analysis. It takes a little more effort, but it's totally doable to then evaluate model structure, uh, uncertainty and model structure as well to see. And what we focus on is does our final answer change? So I'm a little uh, kind of notorious for it maybe with my group, because if they come with the question like, which way should I do this? I say all of them. Um, so it's which assumption should I make? All of them. Uh, you know, set it up such that the model can evaluate it under every reasonable set of assumptions. And so one way we did that, for example, in like our algal modeling. So we had developed a lump pathway metabolic model and, and used a particular formulation for the kinetics. Uh, and, and we were simulating um, uh, performance of the full scale system that we work with. Uh, there are lots of other ways you could structure the model. And, and we even, we led a review paper with uh, some folks in Europe and, and, um, and a few other places that had their own models. So uh, we, you know, picked the things we agreed on, identified the things we didn't. Uh, but then in our own modeling work, what we did was we set up the, the code to be able to use every possible assumption for like how we model light, how we model response to light and photorespiration, how we model nutrient uptake, how we model carbon storage, how we model temperature sensitivity. And what we do is we did a global sensitivity analysis on those model structures to identify which parameters, uh, to which parameters is each model structure most sensitive, uh, which parameters do we feel kind of best about, and which model structures or parameter assumptions lead to a different dis outcome in the, in the performance. And then what we hope for is that the finding is that most of the structures that we generally agree about or generally like lead to the same outcome. And if that's the case, we can agree that those other ones aren't really representative or good model structures. What can happen is that several model structures that are reasonable uh, lead to different outcomes. Well, now we have a proposal <laughs> we can write uh, and potentially look at that further, but it requires additional 
data sets or uh, additional calibration validation of the models. So um, you can absolutely kind of disaggregate the uncertainty from the inputs and the uncertainty in model structure. It's, it just takes more time and work. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, but the last question here, who well, I'll give to my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the biggest driver that I see with utilities in the U.S. is regulations. Uh, two questions. How does your model take regulations into account? And couldn't we get better regulations using some kind of an approach like this? And how might that work? Yeah, uh, important question. So, so for example, the way a, a way that it the model can take this into account is you set it as constraints. So you set those uh, permit requirements as as constraints to the system. And so, one example you know we can use is is the treatment plants in Wisconsin. The reason they're doing the algal technology is because one, the village of Roberts has an annual average limit of 0 0.04 milligrams per liter phosphorus, 0 0.04. And the existing options, like if we're gonna basically evaluate alternatives, one, there's uncertainty in like organic phosphorus. So the precipitate, you can't rely on the chemical precipitation. And so uh, you can to an extent, but it, not necessarily to guarantee below 0.04 all year or on average. Um, and so we then can evaluate different designs or reasonable configurations with a reasonable risk profile and, and put them as alternatives and then do the design and simulation and cost analysis. Um, we can account for things like uh, then risk of not meeting permits, for example, based on any unknowns. And so for the algae, it might be, well, how fast are they, what are the kinetics actually gonna be? Is a, is a kind of predator gonna come through the system and cause problems? What's our, how sure are we that we can maintain stable performance for extended periods of time? For chemical precipitation might be, is there organic phosphorus? What's the risk of that? Can we mitigate that risk by doing a lot of analyses like uh, in, in the, uh, with the influent wastewater, but also go to the industries and so on. Um, so we can set up the model to include permits as a constraint, for example. When we think about setting policies, uh, we absolutely do that as well. Um, the, we, the only time we've kind of published on that work has to do with biofuels and bioproducts. And so, for example, what we've done is we, we set up a package that, that works with Biosteam called Blocks, and it's like Biosteam location-specific um, analyses. And what it does is it lets you, we, we already pulled out all the relevant like biofuels, bioproducts policies at the state level across the US. And a lot of them, they vary. It's like you can get a tax uh, deduction based on your capital equipment. You can get a tax deduction based on your operational expenses or your operational labor expenses up to 150,000 a year or something like that. And so we can implement those and see the impact on the final product and what it might mean for the likelihood that a facility would be built there. Um, so we can evaluate policies in exactly that way. And the reason we're doing it mostly in the biofuels bioproduct space is because these conversations are happening right now they're, they're at the federal level um, and at states like California. Um, Canada has a new re renewable fuel like plan. Um, and so we're doing it with carbon intensity calculations around biofuels and bioproducts. And some policies require that you use a particular tool, GREET, um, to do biofuel LCA. And that basically, it, it boxes you into a particular set of carbon intensity estimates because you can't really make it location too location specific um, versus if a tool allows enough flexibility and you use to, allows you to use any defensible strategy, we can do like farm by farm spatially explicit modeling to say, oh, there are locations where you could have a tremendous benefit for carbon intensity and other locations where it'd actually be a detriment. And, and identify like how to move forward. So there we can illustrate the implications of a particular even wording or uh, methodological requirement in policies. And we're interested in doing more of that in like the water and sanitation space. Our focus in that space has exclusively been like phosphorus. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, please join me in thanking Jeremy again. Yeah, thank you.